Hey, good morning, y'all. This is Ned, and this is Angel over here at My Philippine Dreams. N to the E to the D over at MPD. 215 pounds of twisted steel and sex appeal coming at you from Dumaguete City. Michelle's sleeping. It's Sunday morning. In our last Filipino cultural psychology video, we discussed, we talked about the history that led up to what it is now, the sum total of its parts being what it was. And we talked about the Indo-Malay settlements, we talked about the Chinese influence with their mercantile em empires, we talked about the Spanish, 333 years of the Spanish. And I think that actually the Chinese and the Spanish had a lot of influence on what Filipino cultural psychology is today. And then we talked briefly about the 50 years of Hollywood rule when the Americans came in and we had it set up. So today we're going to be talking about Hia, we're going to be talking about Amor Propio, and we're going to be talking about Utang Alo, which are also three very important pillars to Filipino cultural psychology, trying to figure out why Filipinos do the things they do or don't do the things they do. And it's important for us as expats, as foreigners living in the Philippines, to try to come to under some understanding of why things happen the way they do. It's actually a duty of ours. We have to do this. It's not a duty to the Philippines. It's not a duty to our home nations, but it's a duty to ourselves so that we can better understand what's going on so that our frustration and, that, and our bewilderment doesn't continue to increase and stress us all out. Because a lot of things happen here, if you've been to the Philippines, if you're in the Philippines, that it's hard to wrap your head around. It's, tr it's hard to understand why they do some of the things that we do. And that's the purpose of this series. We're probably going to go on to four parts. In the next part, we'll be talking about Bahala Na. We'll be talking about Balatsi Buyas, which is the onion skin. We'll be talking about, more about colonial mentality and a few other factors. And at the very end, we're going to try to answer the questions of why do Filipinos do the things they do? And some of those questions are, why do they say yes when they mean no? Why do they voluntarily ship themselves off for 20, 30 years as OFWs to take care of their families? Why do they invite total strangers into their home for fiesta celebrations or parties? Why do they have such a hard time taking responsibility for some of the things that they do? And why do they have such a hard time directly negotiating or directly talking to somebody? For example, if you go to get something worked on, your bike worked on, and you'll ask the guy, hey, how much is the labor going to cost? He won't give you an answer usually. He'll say, well, how much do you want, how much do you want to pay? And that's where the Pacquiao, that's where the negotiation begins. But again, as foreigners, it's not something that we're used to. Usually labor is at a set rate, usually very high. And so this whole inability for them to directly negotiate or directly discuss what's to them as sensitive topics is something that we have to understand. All right, Amor Propio. Amor Propio comes from the Spanish and it's a Tagalog term and it literally means love of self. In our understanding it would be seen as self-esteem and a more hardcore Asian influence it would be seen as face. As you hear about in China, losing face, I don't want to lose face, I got to maintain face. And it's an important part of the Filipino cultural psychology. People maintain a more proprio by acting correctly. They obey their parents, they do the things that they're supposed to do, they don't directly confront other people because it's not only maintaining your own a more proprio, but it's maintaining other people's a more proprio so that you don't give offense and that you don't cause a conflagration where some problems can ensue later on. And Filipinos consider their amor propio, their face, to be very important. They don't want to lose it. They don't want to violate it. And that's the reason sometimes they'll say yes when they mean no. They'll actually lie in the face of evidence. If you say, hey, look at this, this, and this, and you did that, they won't take responsibility for it because they don't want to experience he uh, which is the shame, which we're going to talk about in a minute. Amor propio, it seems, comes a lot from the Spanish, from the Spanish and the Chinese. With the Spanish machismo factoring in, and again, the hardcore Asian influence of losing face and maintaining face, despite everything. Now, hia, on the other hand, is when you lose face. It's basically shame, but hia can also be used in the context of shyness. Um, a lot of times when you interact with Filipinos, they'll be very shy, even kids. I don't, and I don't know how this is passed on. I don't know if it's genetic and biological. But even the kids will be very shy. So he uh, accounts for some of that shyness. And it'll also be used interchangeably as Filipino shyness. He uh, is experienced when someone is shamed, when they are confronted directly, when they are accused of something, when they fail to maintain their level of a more propio. And this is something that Filipinos will try to avoid at all costs, even going to extreme measures to avoid that shame. I mean, with some of the murders recently, there was an environmentalist killed up in Palawan, a Frenchman, 
not too long ago, where not only did they kill him because he was acting up against, you know, the fishing, dynamite fishing and mercury fishing and all that, he, they also killed his wife and his kid, his little kid. And some people say, and, some, and this is talking to Filipinos, that they want to get rid of all the witnesses for two reasons. They don't, they, they don't want to be confronted later on with their actions, and they're also looking to get rid of all the witnesses. And that's something that you don't experience in the West, and it's something that kind of blows your mind when you're in the Philippines. So Filipinos will do everything they can to avoid hiya, to avoid that shame, up to including some you know, bewildering displays and denials and refusing to acknowledge certain situations. If they don't know something, if you ask a Filipino a question, a direct question, for example, you're riding along, this has happened to me many times, and you'll say, hey, is Bacolod up ahead or is it to the left here? And they, they won't know, but they don't want to admit that, so they'll just indicate whatever direction, a 50-50 chance, and a lot of times you'll get lost. And I, it, that one's a hard one. That's one of the first ones you run into, is when you're asking for directions in Asa Pitang, whatever and they don't know but they won't say they don't know and then they'll just point in some random direction. Utang na loob. Utang na loob is the final one we'll be discussing and this one is really important. Utang na loob is basically translated as debt of obligation. Utang na loob. It's all about favors given and favors received. There's a lot of reciprocity in that. It's the, give, it's the back and forth of doing favors for other people and expecting them in return. When we talk about the entrenched corruption in the Philippines, Utang na loob has a lot to do with that. And the Pakikisama that we discussed the, in the last episode where maintaining smooth relations and not rocking the boat and not making waves, keeping things as they're going, a conservative, corrupt culture. Utang na loob also factors a lot into the OFWs. There's approximately 2.5 million Filipino workers working in the Middle East, Japan, Canada, USA, you name it, they're all over the place. Actually in Las Vegas and Los Angeles, there's so many Filipinos, they got their own community, and it's actually Jollibees. And I can't see too many Westerners going to Jollibees. So that gives you some indication of how many Filipinos are in just the US alone, San Diego. And this debt of obligation is basically for their families. They're sacrificing their 10, 20, 30 years working as an OFW in the Philippines to send back remittances to their families to support their Philippines. And Utang Nalo plays an important role in this OFW society when you've know, got these 2.5 million Filipinos. And they're doing it to support their families, to take care of their families, to return the obligation that they have to their parents for taking care of them, for feeding them, for clothing them, for sending them to school. And a lot of parents will dig deep to send their kids to school so they can get some skills so they can go OFW to wherever. And those remittances are billions and billions of dollars. It's a huge part of the Filipino yearly income, their GDP. Now, if you want to read more about this, you can actually go to the article that I did over on our website. It actually came out pretty good. Uh, I'm the humblest person I know. And it exp it'll explain it a lot more that I can sit here and babble on about it. Check it out. I'll put a link down in the video description box in one of those little red boxes at the end of the video so you can click on that and go to our website and check it out. Like, dislike, subscribe, share, do all that fun stuff. And until next time, maintain your Amor Propio, avoid hiya, and remember that debt of obligation. This is Ned over My Philippine Dreams. Take care.